We have already looked at energy resources and we saw that we have stocks, fossil fuels and we have flows, renewable energy. We saw that there is sufficient renewable energy to meet our requirement. Now the question is, we have sufficient renewable energy to meet our requirement, but each of these renewable energy sources needs technologies, those technologies need materials. Do we have enough materials to meet the energy requirements or will we end up in a problem related to materials? So the questions that we would, the issues that we would like to address, one is will we run out of materials? Can we create a closed loop material system? Which renewable energy materials will be constrained and what will be the impact? We are not going to completely answer all these questions, but we will look at the way in which we can analyze this and what are the typical types of materials and how they are looking at it. So if we look at uh, the uh, materials, we find that of the, uh, the significant amount of our CO2 emissions are accounted for by some of the most energy intensive and carbon intensive materials. If you look at materials, we are looking at steel, we look at cement, we look at aluminum, paper, plastic and these accounts for the largest chunk of the uh, carbon emissions. It is about 10 gigatons of CO2 out of the total of 28 gigatons of CO2 in a particular year, I think it is uh, 2008. And uh, this is from the paper by uh, Alwood. You can look at this paper for more details. So if we look at the periodic table, which I am sure all of you are familiar with, you have studied it at some point of time, either in your school or your college. And you can see that there are several of these materials including some of these rare earths and some of now these materials which are being becoming important for batteries, for storage, for photovoltaics. You have this whole set of materials which are coming in for the photovoltaics, for the lead acid batteries, cadmium telluride, then you have the uh, other uh, chromium, nickel, cobalt, then you have lithium, then you have these. Uh, materials which are used for hydrogen storage and uh, many of these materials uh, uh, involved are located in some regions and in a few countries and uh, they also involve significant amount of energy use in their extraction. Um, so when we look at materials, we can think in terms of material efficiency and this is from the paper by Allwood, we can try and design so that we use less materials. So we can, this is called dematerialization, you know look at your cell phone or look at a motor, see how much steel and uh, how much metal is going into it, see if you can have the same functionality using less metal. Uh, we can also replace the substitute energy intensive materials by less energy intensive materials, uh, materials that are less carbon intensity. So this is, that is we can do dematerialization, we can do light weighting and now with nanotechnology we have the advantage that we can actually have designer materials which have the properties that we require. For instance, it has been told that you know if you look at the Eiffel Tower and you look at the weight of that Eiffel Tower, today if you have designer steel uh, with uh, nano um, uh, composites and uh, uh, engineered steel, you can actually we could uh, reduce the quantity of steel that is required with the same strength and uh, we, we can get a much more lightweight Eiffel Tower with using less m materials. Um, in general, when we look at uh, the production of a material, we can look at the production going to the, uh, uh, and you have the, uh, at each stage of the production, there would be some scrap. We can recycle that scrap that uh, I, when we look at the demand and then the after the 
post demand when it is used it can be recycled and some part of it. So, we can try to see if we can have this entire thing as entire loop as a loop which is um, closed and we use relatively less amounts of um, virgin material and we can try and recycle at each of these stages. If we look at the global material use, you will see that energy intensive materials account for about 50 percent of the industrial energy use, cement, steel, paper, chemicals, fertilizers. And uh, also the interesting thing is that most of these now the, uh, these materials are being consumed by the developing countries. There are much higher growth rates in the developing countries. We have if we look at any of these materials, we can plot if you look at let us say steel use per person and we look at the status of the country in terms of GDP per capita or GDP per person. You find that this increases with income to a point where it stabilizes and then maybe declines. This is something like the, this is called the Kuznets curve. So, most of the developing countries are at this stage where there is this growth. Developed countries have already gone where you have already produced all the steel, uh, you have your infrastructure is already created, you have the f number of cars and the kind of things which is there and then the number of it, it starts declining and so that is that's the kind of thing and I will just show you some of this um, trends. So, if you look at steel, you see different countries, North America, Europe, you can see China and India over here and you can see that this is corresponding to something like uh, we go to a stagnation level which is of the order of about 450 kgs per person per year. So, it is an apparent consumption as a function of income, high growth rates for developing countries and it goes to saturation, there is an implications on the global energy use. Um, this similar thing you can see for instance for cement, you can look at the kind of different different levels at which you have these developing countries which are growing in these cases it is more or less saturating of course, it is saturating at different kinds of levels. And this is sort of global demand uh, normalized you can see that there is an overall growth. Uh, the Ashby has uh, come up with this, this scientist in the uh, UK who is created these kind of design plots and these design plots are extremely interesting in terms of when you look at a particular characteristic for instance you look at uh, the Young's modulus energy per meter cube and if that is the requirement which is uh, for a particular application and we are choosing between the metals, polymers, uh, ceramics and you have the embodied energy which is the total energy required create that material and to extract it and to make it available um, from nature uh, per cubic meter. So, based on this we can use uh, with this we can decide between different materials and see what is the implication when we are making a particular choice in terms of what is the amount of energy that is being used. So, this could be used and we can have similar kinds of plots giving the carbon intensity of these. Uh, this is another plot which is talking about the strength and the strength in terms and the embodied energy. So, these, these are interesting design aids which can be used for us to choose less energy intensive materials and less carbon intensive materials for a particular ac application. Uh, and uh, so, you know the uh, we will when we talk about embodied um, energy and we do the life cycle we will look at this a little more in detail, uh, but one can uh, look at different types of elements and see what kind of energy is embodied and what kind of efficiency is there. Uh, 
So, in general what has happened is that one expects that with materials as we uh, as the demand increases and if the in most of the materials we are looking at a finite stock. So, these are the stocks, but then there are possibilities of substitutes and with technology improvement it is possible that we can have um, less use of the material, but in general what one expects is that materials will we will run out of materials and so there was this debate uh, and you can see this uh, there is a very interesting bet which was there in literature and you can see in uh, science in 19 uh, uh, there is a journal uh, article published by um, professor Julian Simon in 1980 and um, he basically felt that uh, planet's resources are not finite. Um, there has been uh, ecologists and environmentalists were saying that we need to look at materials getting over, we need to look at the uh, resources and he said that planet resources are actually not finite. Um, the on the other side of the bet were uh, Malthusians, uh, Paul Ehrlich, John Hart and John Holdren and uh, they have been saying that the we have one world one earth and uh, finite resources and we need to conserve and uh, use our resources efficiently. Uh, so, Simon challenge through an open challenge saying that if the scarcity is due to population growth and the prices of all natural resources, grain, oil, timber, metal should rise at any future de date. And uh, he said that he is willing to bet anyone because he believes that uh, technology uh, and human innovation is such that uh, there is no risk, uh, uh, scarcity caused by human uh, efforts and uh, he, uh, he said that he was willing to bet anyone that prices would decline at any future date and he made an offer that any natural resources can be picked at any future date. So, we, when this challenge was issued, uh, Paul Ehrlich and uh, John Hart and uh, John Holdren uh, took up the challenge. Uh, Ehrlich, John Holdren and John Hart accepted the challenge in October 1980 and they chose the following materials, chrome, copper, nickel, tin and tungsten and they bet a token amount of 200 dollars each at 1980 prices on these five. So, a total of a thousand dollars and the idea was that in 1980 at thousand dollars they bought a certain amount of this and the idea was to the future date of 1990 was picked and it was said that whether these would the value would be more than thousand dollars or less than thousand dollars. If this was more than thousand dollars then Simon lost the bet and Simon has to pay that difference to them. If the prices actually declined, if it was less than thousand dollars, they have lost the bet and they have to pay Simon. So, what do you think happened? In this particular case, actually Ehrlich, John Holden and John Hart actually lost the bet and uh, you can see this, this is these are the commodities which the which were mentioned. Um, the you can see that this was the in the 1980 and when you look at 1990 you find that actually the prices went down. Um, so, essentially what happened is that uh, you can see that this is this is what happened in uh, 1980, this is the situation in 1990. And um, so, with the result that they, uh, the this of course did not prove it conclusively because uh, this goes through ups and downs and there was an economist uh, article recently which said that it just so happened that he was unlucky to choose the years, if it had been some other years uh, then this would be the kind of situation. But the fact remains that overall there are two trends which are there. One is that there is a problem in terms of scarcity, but also with the technological innovation 
and volumes, uh, the cost reductions are there. So, over a long time period, we, we have seen very significant reductions in costs of materials. Uh, so, you can see for instance, if you look at copper, real price of copper has been going down. And uh, so, it's not, it is not clear there is an issue of scarcity, but there is also an innovation and uh, possibility of technological improvements. And so, when we talk in terms of materials, we have to be aware of scarcities in the short term, but it's not it is not uh, completely apparent that uh, this will necessarily result in uh, extremely high prices. There could be backstop technologies and other options which are available. So, for all of these materials, we can use the same static R by P ratio or we can use uh, something like the Hubbard's curve if you want to estimate time periods. Uh, in many of these cases, uh, these are all these price trends. Uh, in many of the cases, if you see, uh, we can uh, actually uh, look at what kind of, uh, what is the distribution of these materials. So, sometimes uh, regionally, uh, some countries have, for instance, if you look at lithium, it is only available in a few countries of the world. Uh, so, the control of these materials and this could uh, involve getting an advantage and then the industry and the development may be affected by it. So, we may need to look at substitutes. So, with this well, we have seen, uh, we have got a quick introduction of the kind of um, materials that are used for the energy sector. We looked at uh, over with development that material use per capita will uh, increase and then saturate and maybe then decline. And then there could be possibilities in terms of substitution by more energy efficient and low carbon materials. And then we can uh, look at, it is not essential that scarcity uh, of materials always results in increase of price. Uh, historical trends show that there is also a, a scope for innovation um, and technology improvements where prices may actually decline uh, with time. Uh, with this, we end the portion on materials. For those who are interested, there are more details in some of these papers. You can look at the, pa the uh, GEA, you can look at uh, the papers by Allwood, uh, and the, about the bet, you can look at John Tierney's uh, original article in New York Times, uh, which gives you about the betting on the planet. Um, in the next session, we will start with looking at the historical way of the mine manager's problem. If you own a mine, how much of that mine should you allow to be used every year? And we will cast this as an optimization problem and see how uh, a resource, a coal, a coal or oil or gas, how it should be mined and distributed over uh, future generations. Thank you.